We'll be reading from Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Uh, I'll ask you to stand. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Thank you, Father, for your precious word. Thank you because your word is truth and it's life. We come together, O oh Father, to worship you this morning. And uh, we have taken the time as a corporate body of believers, your saints, to worship you and to give you thanks for what you have done in our lives. And even this past week, we thank you for the grace and the mercy and the love that you have poured upon us. And you have sustained us. You have carried us. Whatever we went through this week, you have uh, given us your grace. And here we are worshiping your name. Your name is above every other name. We thank you for our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, who has died on the cross, has bled for the remissions of our sins, and you have resurrected him, and you have placed him on your right-hand side, and he is our high priest, our Redeemer, who is constantly interceding for those that he loves and and we know, Jesus, that you love us. And because you loved us, we love you back. Bless your servant, Pastor John. Anoint him uh, so that your word may be preached with effectiveness and that your word may um, uh, conform us to the image of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. O Holy Spirit, sanctify your word unto our lives, unto our mind, unto our heart, unto our soul, with all our strength, O Father, that we may magnify your name. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Ask you to stay standing as we sing these songs together. Just a reminder, you do have to keep your masks on when we sing. Let's open up with this first song, His Mercy is More.
Continue with this next hymn, The Solid Rock.
What a wonderful truth. All other ground is sinking sand. We bless you for that, Father. Please be seated. Um, we're coming to the close of a, one season. And soon we're going to be into another season, winter. And I was hoping that by then we would no longer be wearing masks, but I guess it seems that things are going to be continuing this way for quite some time. You know, every month the board and, uh, and I and everyone in leadership, I mean, we're just surprised how God has been providing and we've been me able to meet the budget. Sometimes it's been rough, but then the next month... Um, God's people came through once again, and, and we just want to praise God for your faithfulness and giving, for your sacrifice, and for your generosity. And those of you who've come prepared with an envelope, you can, uh, there's a basket next to en Enrique's, of course, and there's Maneris giving as usual. Most of us are giving online, but again, whichever way you choose, it doesn't matter. We praise God for the generosity of God's people. And then we continue with prayer every Wednesday at 7.30, and it's wonderful to gather. You know, I've, I've been going accustomed now more and more in meeting on, uh, on Zoom. It's not my favorite thing, but now I'm, I'm, I'm less bothered by it, let's say. And it's wonderful to meet with God's people and to see their lovely faces every Wednesday and just to hear their prayers. It's just what an honor. Home groups continue, and men's groups, WOW, of course. WOW takes place this Friday at 7.30. So ladies, please remember that. This, on Zoom again at 7.30, the ladies meet for their WOW event. Um, the ABM, the annual business meeting, takes place this evening and for all members. Uh, so you've already received the material. you received the information regarding the meet, the Zoom ID, and so forth. If you um, are more than one member in your house, let's say, you, you and your spouse, let's say, then we recommend you use two different devices. And if you can't, then fine, but try to do that. That's this evening at 7. I've been saying in the past week that 6 p.m. It's not. It's at 7 p.m. this evening. So please take a note of that. And of course, this is OCC period, Operation Christmas Child, when we hand out... Uh, boxes to be filled out by not only members, but friends and everyone alike. Now, as I said in the past, churches, um, many churches this year are not participating. We are, and we're not only participating, we are a center of distribution. So we are grateful to God for uh, this opportunity. Darlene and Cordula are faithfully serving. There are volunteers that are helping with uh, them, and we just want to be committed to this project and make sure that these shoe boxes reach the children in Africa and Central America. Um, as usual, to participate in Saturday's gatherings, you need to register. So as of Monday, you, re you receive an email. And if you're not on the email list, just speak to Anna right after the gathering. Make sure you're on that list. You're going to receive an email, and that's how you register. All right, and please do so as of Monday, the latest Tuesday, so that uh, you won't lose your spot. Now, if the spots are filled, then just uh, go online, and or rather, there's a waiting list. Go on the waiting list and add your name to that waiting list. I think those are all the announcements. Let's turn to the Word of God, and let's uh, read 
in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21 to 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, 21 to 22, and we're nearing the end of chapter 3. Would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Father, we are delighted to uh, gather. We always expected some kind of persecution to hinder us from meeting. We never thought that it would come in the form of a virus. We never thought that, that this would take place. But Lord, throughout this period, your word has been our comfort, our strength. We read it with such joy, such pleasure. Where would we be without your precious word? Again, I ask that you would quicken our hearts as we listen to your voice. Strengthen your people for your name's sake as we walk the paths of righteousness in this very troublesome and confusing time. Be our strength. Be our everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We began our journey in the letter of Peter, 1 Peter, eight months ago, February. <laughs> and we're still gleaning from this book. Who would have ever thought that God would have used this letter to speak to us during COVID-19? And that's what's been happening. God has been speaking to us through this letter. And I've been learning so much as I glean deeper, more, as I dig deeper, rather, and glean more from this book. So just for a moment, let's just summarize what we've been learning for the past few uh, weekends. We'll look at Peter's line of thinking so far. He, he's been speaking to the suffering believers of Asia Minor. He mentions five regions and cities, if you would. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And the Christians living in Asia Minor, in this area of the Roman Empire, were suffering, suffering terribly, suffering for their faith, facing great persecution. And Peter was reminding them that just as Christ suffered as he obeyed the Father and was vindicated, so you too will be vindicated. You have nothing to fear. He was encouraging them. And then Peter stops in his tracks and considers this unusual trip that the Lord took immediately after his death and before his resurrection. It says that he went in spirit to the spirits now in prison. So spirits that are in chains and bound in this Alcatraz of the unseen world. And there he made a proclamation of victory, a victory over darkness. But while he made a proclamation, he also made propitiation. As his body hung on the cross, the justice of God was fully satisfied. That's why John writes in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 2, and he, Jesus, himself, is the propitiation for our sins. That means that nothing we can do will satisfy God's justice. God's anger is aimed at us and is only absorbed by the Son of God. If you're not in the Son, God's anger will target you and will judge you. That's what John says. So there was a proclamation and there was propitiation. And then he, Peter takes this bizarre turn. And he introduces Noah and the flood. Why Noah? 
What relevance does Noah have with believers who are aliens in this world? Now you will say, well, there is a relevance. Noah lived in a time where he was ridiculed. He was walking with God, whereas the rest were not. And so there's that relevance. But Peter goes beyond that. He makes a relevance, a connection rather, between the flood and baptism. And we're going to see that in a moment. We need to first look at Old Testament baptism. There was baptism in the Old Testament, by the way. In verse 21 of the passages we just read in Peter, it says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Now, we all know what a bath is. We take it because we want to keep clean. But in the Old Testament, there was a ceremonial cleansing that God's people were commanded to observe every time they would be made unclean. In which way they would become unclean? Well, there are several ways. But, for example, if someone was um, dead, right? Someone died in the family. Every member in that household would naturally be drawn to that dead relative, right? So the father had passed away, the wife would hug him, the children would cry, they would hug the body. You know, he had just passed away. That would make them unclean. And so to, uh, to rectify that, they would have to follow a cleansing procedure. And in Jewish circles today, that is still maintained. You may have heard of these bathhouses that were shut down during COVID-19 because they still maintain the ceremonial cleansing. We read about one such instance in Leviticus chapter 17 where there, the person is made unclean by a certain action and then what he had to do. So in Leviticus 17, verses 15 and 16, we read, when any person eats an animal which dies, so he's eating an animal that is defined by the wayside, by the wayside is dead, or is torn by beasts, whether he is a native, in other words, whether he's a, a Hebrew, a Jew, or an alien, someone from the outside, he shall wash his clothes, bathe in water, and remain unclean, even though he's washed, he has to remain unclean, until evening, then he's clean. But if he does not wash them or bathe his body, then he shall bear his guilt. To be clean meant you were allowed to interact with the others, with God's people, and you were allowed to go to the temple. If you were unclean, you were not to go into the temple at all. Because the priest would ask you, are you clean? And there are many ways, like I said, that person, a person could become unclean. And so there was the ritual of baptism, ceremonial cleansing. It's not called baptism in the Old Testament. It's called ceremonial cleansing, the ritual of washing. But it is a baptism because they would bathe themselves. So we see here a full body immersion in water by an individual who had eaten flesh of a carcass that he found laying by the wayside. And this type of ceremonial cleansing is still practiced today by Orthodox Jews. So when Peter writes, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, he is saying that the believer's baptism is different from the Old Testament cleansing. The Old Testament baptism or cleansing, ceremonial cleansing, was basically covered rather only the body. Old Testament baptism was carried out multiple times because you, don't, you may have found someone who was dead, walked into a house, and someone had just died. You're now unclean. Or you would sit on a seat where someone who was unclean was sitting on, someone who was on her period, for example. And so you'd sit on that same chair, you became unclean. There were many ways of becoming unclean. You would touch, uh, by chance, a leper. You're unclean. So on and on it goes. It doesn't stop. And so they would constantly go through this baptism. It was not a once-in-a-lifetime event. And it was the cleansing of the flesh, the removal of dirt from the body. So Peter, Peter is differentiating from Old Testament baptism, or it's called more precisely ceremonial cleansing, from New Testament uh, baptism. 
there's something very interesting about what takes place if a man refuses, or a woman refuses, to comply with this requirement, this statute. We read in um, Numbers 19, verse 20, the man who is unclean and does not purify himself from uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from the midst of the assembly because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water for impurity has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. So imagine I would, again, bring the example of someone who died in my home and I'm embracing him. And for whatever reason, I'm not going through the ceremonial cleansing. I don't want to go through this baptism. It's very demanding. It takes uh, time that's precious to me. So I just go to the temple. I've defiled the sanctuary. I've defiled God's people. And I had to be cut off. It means I was cut off from God's people. I was excommunicated, thrown out completely. You're no longer part of God's people. So it's clear that ceremonial cleansing was very important. Um, otherwise, God would have never said this in Numbers 19. Now let's look at New Testament baptism. In verse 21, baptism now saves you. So we just finished speaking about the removal of dirt, Old Testament ceremonial cleansing or Old Testament baptism. Now, baptism, speaking of now, now saves you. The believer's baptism is unlike the cleansing that the Jews would practice because it was, it's only once in your lifetime. And secondly, it does not remove dirt from the flesh. It does, it's not an external cleansing. But there's more than that. But before we go into New Testament or the Christian baptism, we're going to look at John's baptism. Because John's baptism all of a sudden now becomes a lot more clear once we understand Old Testament baptism or ceremonial cleansing. And let's look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, and there we're introduced to John's baptism. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem was going out to him. And all of Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. As they confessed their sins. So the ceremonial cleansing that they were required to do. They were doing it with John. That's what was happening. They were doing it in the Jordan River. Now who was John the Baptist? He was a priest. How do we know that? Because his father, Zacharias, was a priest. And the children of priests were priests, the sons. So John was a priest. Where did the priests serve? Well, priests served in the temple. All priests were in the temple. And every time someone would come, are you clean? That's the first question they would ask. Are you clean? John did ask the question. John made sure they were clean. While every priest was in the temple, John was in the river. And he was commanding them to observe the law of Moses. And what would he say? He says, confess your sins and whatever sin. But he wasn't interested if they had touched a dead body. He wasn't interested if they, if someone had seated, uh, had been sitting down in a seat that was now unclean because a woman with a period had sat there. He wasn't interested in that. He wasn't interested if someone was touching the woman who had, was suffering from hemorrhaging for 12 years and now was unclean. Right? He wasn't interested in that. He was interested in other things. He was interested in the way they were treating each other. He was interested in their greed. He was going deeper. And his message was resonating with God's people. And he was telling them, Messiah is just around the corner. You have to get baptized. You have to become clean if you're going to be ready for his message. Because you're not ready. And so the people would come into the water and they would confess their sins. Not that they had touched a dead body. Not that they had eaten the flesh of a carcass, but that they had sins that were far deeper. Their greed. And, and the fact that they weren't sharing with those who were in need. The fact that they were extorting when they should have been content with their salary and so forth. And he was bringing them to the point where they saw their sins because all those figures, those types 
we're all pointing to sins that are far real, far more real than simply touching a corpse or eating the flesh of a carcass. They were all figures. They were all pictures of a sins that really mattered to God. And John was explaining, this is what matters to God. And all of a sudden, they understood it. Then he said, I confess. And as they were confessing, they were getting baptized. So we see how John's baptism is linked to the ceremonial cleansing of the Old Testament. Now Jesus comes in the picture, the Messiah. John introduces him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's far more than what the law could ever do. The law points out your sin, but the law cannot take away your sin. He's the Lamb. And so Jesus now introduces baptism. In Mark 16, we read these words who, uh, quoted by Jesus here, and it says, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Another, now there's a new, different dimension to baptism. The first thing we can see is that Old Testament baptism had nothing to do with salvation. It just kept you in fellowship with the law. And so it allowed you to enter the sanctuary and allowed you to uh, connect with people, of God's people. Ceremonial cleansing was carried out multiple times during the year. But the believer's baptism is done once. And it's done only after one believes the gospel. Believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Lamb of God, who came to die for our sins. And he who doesn't believe in this truth, in the gospel, is condemned. It's different. There are similarities, but it's different. Let me digress. There are some pastors who will say things like this. You go on their websites, by the way. They'll, you'll see it over and over. You belong before you believe. You belong before you believe. That sounds nice. Very welcoming. But it's totally unscriptural. God's word says the opposite. If you don't believe, you don't belong. If you don't believe, you are under condemnation. There's judgment. We can't fool ourselves into thinking that we belong even if we don't believe. And for this reason, we insist that Holy Communion be served only to those who are believers and have confirmed their decision with water baptism. I often get the question, can I be a believer and not be baptized? According to Scripture, the answer is yes. Provided you are like the penitent thief on the cross who has not, been, was not afforded the chance to get baptized. If you are in a, on your deathbed, if you are in prison, if you are in some way handicapped from getting baptized, and you believe with your heart, yes. For Paul says in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So the thief on the cross confessed with his mouth that Jesus was indeed Lord. Remember me when you shall come into your kingdom. You're a king. You're going to resurrect. There's a kingdom that's awaiting. I want to be part of that. Remember me. He believed. With his heart, he confessed with his mouth. He was saved. He never got the chance to get baptized. But to use his example to somehow skirt baptism, avoid believer baptism altogether, is twisting scripture like a pretzel. Baptism was never an option for the early church. It was a requirement for all believers. No one, no believer skipped baptism. No exceptions. We see how important it was from Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 2.38, Peter, after preaching the gospel, says to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind that Peter was speaking to devout Jews. The Jews in Jerusalem at that time, they were the best of the best. They traveled from afar to observe Passover and 50 days later, Pentecost. They were the cream of the crop. They were faithful observers of the law. And most likely, Paul was in that crowd. At that time, it was called Saul. When Peter preaches this, he preaches to a crowd of thousands. There must have been hundreds of thousands of Jews gathered in Jerusalem. And he's preaching this. And of that crowd, it says 3,000 believed and were baptized. They didn't just believe. They were baptized. Peter was saying to them, you are unclean. That's what he's saying. They understood it because they can connect with the Old Testament. They knew that if they didn't go through ceremonial cleansing, they would remain unclean and they would be cut off. They could not go into the sanctuary. So now Peter's saying, you have to get baptized. You are unclean before God. You will be cut off because you have rejected his son. You've crucified him. And they were, it says, convicted. And 3,000 of them believed and were baptized. If you don't get baptized, you're under judgment. That's what he's saying. Because you are openly confessing Jesus as Lord through your baptism. A believer who refuses to get baptized is failing to make their confession of faith. And therefore is walking in disobedience. He or she is doing their own thing. No one who belongs to Christ does his own thing. He is Lord. We're not. We are disciples of Christ. We submit to his lordship. So of course, here Peter also is explaining what is the greatest of all sin. The greatest of all sin is rejecting the Messiah. It's not touching a corpse. It's not eating flesh of a dead animal. It's not sitting down where a woman with her period had just seated, had been seated. No, that's not it. He goes, it's rejecting the Messiah. They understood, and therefore they believed, and their belief was followed with baptism. The necessity of baptism. Verse 3, baptism now saves you. What does Peter mean when he says that baptism now saves you? Is Peter endorsing baptismal regeneration? Baptismal regeneration is the belief that you are only saved when you're baptized. You're only saved when you're baptized. That's what baptismal regeneration is. In other words, once you get baptized, that's when salvation takes place. Baptismal regeneration. And it's similar to what the Catholic Church teaches when it comes to the Eucharist or pedo-baptism, infant baptism. These are sacraments. And if you don't embrace those sacraments, there are seven of them in all, if you don't embrace them, you're not saved. You're in limbo. And there are Christian denominations, besides Catholics, that teach baptismal regeneration. They claim that if you're not baptized, you're not saved. And the reason why they teach this is because they are taking the Old Testament ceremonial cleansing example and applying it wrongly to baptism. That's how you wrongly divide Scripture, basically. And they naturally conclude, because if you didn't ceremonially go through cleansing, you were cut off, therefore, if you don't get baptized, you're not saved. The problem with that position is, first, it's nowhere in Scripture. Secondly, what do we say of the penitent thief? What do we say of believers who got, get, baptized, uh, get saved in prison, on their deathbed? doesn't hold water. However, you must be careful not to swing the pendulum to their side and say, you know, baptism is optional. I was got baptized as an infant, by the way, and, you know, I think that baptism is valid. It's not. Listen to Ananias' words to Paul, who had been blind for three days after encountering the Lord on his way to Damascus. And by the way, Paul must have ceremony cleansed himself over and over because he was a strict observer of the law. He was a Pharisee, as he says in Philippians chapter 3, how he strictly, he was blameless. So he constantly 
went through Old Testament baptism, which was a repeated task. But this is Ananias speaking to Paul. Paul, you know, was on his mission to arrest and torture and imprison Christians in Damascus. He needed authorization from the Sanhedrin. He got it. This was in another country, Syria. Damascus did not belong to Judea. didn't belong to Palestine. So he goes out into another country. He goes amongst Jews. That's what he was doing. He was going to synagogues. And he would say, anyone who's a Christian, stand up. And he would arrest and torture. That was his purpose. Until the Lord meets him. And Ananias now meets him after three days that he was in a home. He had not eaten. He had not drunk water. And he was blind. And this is what Ananias tells him. Now why do you delay? Paul was delaying. What was he delaying? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. How do you wash away your sin? You call on that name. Jesus, your Lord. The very name you've been persecuting. Christians, you've been arresting and torturing. And the Lord told you, why are you persecuting me? He's revealed himself to you. Why are you delaying? It was more than an exhortation. It was a command. Get up and get baptized. You see, Paul felt like a scumbag, a worm. He goes, I've been fighting God. I know what I deserve now. I deserve death. What can cleanse me from this? I've been unclean many times in my life. And I've gone through ceremonial cleansing. What can cleanse me from this? I deserve to die. I've been fighting God. He knew that. And Ananias tells him instead, you're going to be an apostle. You deserve death. But God is going to be merciful. He's going to use you. But you're going to suffer a lot. Get up and be baptized. And wash away your sins. How do you wash those? That's what they would do. They would go into the water. They would confess whatever sin. And their sin was the sin of unbelief. And that's what baptism is. It's not only a confession of faith. It is also a confession of guilt. The guilt of unbelief. I confess I do not believe in you. I confess that I did not see you as my Savior. I confess that, I was, that you were not my Lord. I was Lord of my life. But now you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I confess you, my Savior, and my God. This is the sin you confess when you get baptized. You confess the sin of unbelief by calling on His name, and you confirm your repentance by getting water baptized. So there's a popular belief, like I said, among Christians that teaches that baptism is optional. And that's nowhere to be found in Scripture. And far from it, baptism is not an option. It is a command. It is an ordinance. It is the gateway into the church. You go through baptism into the church. That's how you become part of the church. You don't become part of the church from, from some back door. There is no other door. Baptism is the door. And if you're not baptized, you're not still fully part of the church. You confess the sin of unbelief in water baptism, and you confirm your repentance in water baptism. If you refuse to get water baptized, you're still not part of the church. You may be attending, you may be loved, but you're not part of the church yet. Through baptism, you become a full-fledged member of the body of Christ, and you start your life as a disciple. That's why Jesus said, go into the world, preach the gospel, and making disciples of all nations. How do you make a disciple? Baptizing them. No baptism, no discipleship. Baptizing them. So in this way, baptism not only saves you, or rather not only are you declaring that you're saved and that you are regenerated, but you are confessing to the visible world, your friends, your family, that you believe in Jesus Christ and in the gospel. And you're confessing to the spirit world, the unseen angels, both holy and evil, that you belong to the Lord, that you are part of the church. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ, and heaven rejoices. Now let's look at the benefit of baptism. Verse 21, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. 
Peter says that baptism does not wash away dirt. It doesn't take away the sin from the outside. Water cannot cleanse us. It doesn't save us. There's no such thing as baptism or regeneration. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. However, baptism does cleanse an area of your life. Your conscience. I've already addressed the topic of conscience a few weeks ago, but I do want to draw your attention to what Peter says about the conscience and as it relates to baptism. He says that your conscience experiences a cleansing when you get baptized. There's a clean conscience, a clear conscience. I've often asked people who are just, uh, have just been baptized. I've asked them, how do you feel? I know what you know is true, but how do you feel right now? He goes, tell you the truth, I feel light. I feel like a feather. And you may all remember that when you got baptized. You feel like a feather. And the reason why you feel light is because your conscience has been impacted when you got water baptized. Your conscience was clear, cleared. Whenever we obey God's word, whenever we obey, our conscience gives us a message of approval. Whenever we disobey or about to disobey, our conscience sends us a red signal. Baptism, when carried out after regeneration, after you've been born again, after you've been raised from the dead and made a child of God, will produce a clear conscience. The moment you confess in those waters that you have, were not a believer, but now that you believe, it produces a clear conscience. When you say, I confess my sin of unbelief, and I confess Jesus as Lord, as you are getting baptized, your conscience is cleaned. You have fellowship with God. If you refuse to get baptized, your fellowship is seriously hindered. Seriously hindered. If not lost altogether, your conscience is not clear. That's what Peter says. It is the death of Christ that saves us from our sins. It is baptism that clears the conscience. So while we do not believe in baptismal regeneration, while we know that baptism does not wash away our filth and our sins, since those are not in God's word, we do not dare undervalue baptism. We don't say it's unimportant, it's optional. God forbid we take the teaching of baptism lightly. If you haven't yet obeyed the Lord, then the words to Paul are for you as well. Get up and be baptized and be washed away from your sins by calling on the Lord's name. Now let's look at Noah's baptism. Now there's one verse I did not read, the previous verse. It started, our, the, the passage we started with was, the, the words was corresponding. And you don't start a sentence with corresponding. Obviously that links to the previous verse, which is verse 20. So let's read verse 20 and 21. We already read 21, but we're going to see them together. During the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. So, Peter is connecting the believer's baptism with the flood. With the flood. Now, we understand linking baptism, New Testament baptism, with ceremonial cleansing of the Old Testament, or baptism in the Old Testament, okay? It's not called baptism, but it's multiple times, as we just said. But we understand linking those two. There's a connection. But how do you connect the believer's baptism with the flood? This worldwide catastrophe. What has that got to do with baptism? Let's see the stark difference between the two. First, baptism is a joyful experience. The flood was a frightening moment of divine judgment. Baptism takes place after one believes in the gospel. The flood took place because of unbelief in the part of the inhabitants in Noah's day. They refused to believe the preaching of Noah. Baptism is done in obedience to Christ's command. The flood took place because of disobedience. Heaven rejoices when there's baptism. God's wrath was visible at the flood. Where's the link? Where's the link? There is a connection and a very important one. Peter uses the imagery of the flood to communicate how the water of Noah's day was judgment and salvation at the same time. Judgment for one 
salvation for the other. For the inhabitants of the earth who were wicked and mostly demonized, the waters were an expression of divine judgment. But for Noah and his family, the flood waters were means of salvation. Baptism in water is the line of demarcation. Have you ever seen someone say, you cross this line and you are going to get it. Or if you cross this line, you are on my team. A line of demarcation. We know what those are on the street. You cannot cross a yellow line. As we're going one way, the cars are coming the opposite sense. There's a line of demarcation. Baptism is the line of demarcation between believers and unbelievers. The believers then, who were Noah and the, his children, their eight and all, his wife and so forth, the believers entered the ark and went through the waters. The unbelievers who refused to believe and refused to enter the ark also went through the waters. One group was saved, the other perished. The ones outside perished, of course, and the ones inside the ark believed. The ark of Noah foreshadowed the another ark. Not of wood, but of flesh, our Lord Jesus Christ. A special day when this ark would come into the world and would position itself on Mount Calvary. That's the ark. It's Christ himself. Anyone who believes in him enters Christ. That's why we're called in him. You read that expression multiple times in the New Testament. We are in him, in him. We are in the ark. And in Him alone we escape eternal judgment. Anyone and everyone outside of the ark, outside of Christ, will face God's wrath, the judgment that will come on all those who are outside the ark. No exceptions. Listen to what the writer to the Hebrews writes about the flood and Noah. Hebrews 11.7 By faith Noah being warned by God and things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. In building the ark, Noah did two things. He condemned and he saved. He condemned and he saved. And that condemnation and that salvation met materialized with the flood. When you get baptized, you condemn and you confess. You condemn and you confess your salvation. You condemn the world for their unbelief and you confess Christ and therefore your salvation is confirmed. An ark has been prepared for over 2,000 years and believers since then have been entering the ark through the waters of baptism. That's how you enter this ark. Through your baptism, you condemn the world and you call them to repentance. Through your baptism, you're confessing that God, God's word, God's testimony regarding the Son is true, that He indeed is Jesus the Savior, the Lamb of God, the one who became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. This is the gospel. This is amazing. God prepared this for us. So the words of Ananias are worthy of repetition. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. If you haven't yet opened your heart to the Lord, and the Spirit of God is drawing you to the Savior and you're seeing Him for the first time as the beloved Lamb of God, do not delay anymore. Open your heart. Say yes to Him. Heavenly Father, when we consider all that You have done for us and how one thing connects to another 
one truth delves into another. One verse connects beautifully into another. We see your masterpiece of revelation. We see the truth of God being so unique. Nothing like it in the world. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for this beautiful letter and the verses we just delved into today. I thank you for God's people whose hearts are hungry, who desire more of you. That's a miracle that only you can produce. Whatever insights into the word you give me is also because of your grace. And you do it for the flock so that they are fed, that they are strengthened, so that they obey and they are conformed to the image of Christ. Lord, we thank you. For all of this is all your doing. Those whom you have for you for new, you have predestined to be conformed to the image of your Son. And those who have been predestined, you have called. And those you've called, you've justified. And those you've justified, you have glorified. We bless you. We praise you. Almighty God, thank you, Holy Spirit, for stamping your word deep in our hearts. Pray for those, Lord, who are in the valley of indecision. They would climb out of it like Paul did. And they would embrace Christ, embrace Him as their Lamb who died for them, their propitiation. They would confess Him and get baptized. And by baptism, condemn the world for their unbelief and join the family of God in preparation for Your wonderful coming. Oh, we look forward to that day when we will see You face to face. We feel that those days are so far away sometimes, but as we look around us, we think they're very close. Very close. Such chaos. Such confusion. Such wickedness that we can witness in this world. Lord, we say with the Spirit, Lord Jesus, come, sweep us away so that we may see you and be with you forever. For your name's sake we pray. Amen. Lord be with you.